Hey everyone, this is George Coase with a Mindset Monday on a Sunday. Hey everyone, this is George Coase. Thank you so much for joining me in this little mini series of Mindset Monday that I wanted to put together for you as many people are either immersed in the new school year or about to start. And I wanted to do this because uh, it's a good way for me to just kind of reflect, share some of my learning with you, uh, give my guests some time. Uh, not everyone lives, listens to podcasts and education over the summer too. So I didn't want to take a space from my guests where nobody's listening. If, if anyone's going to take that, I'll take it. But it's a really great way for me to learn and, and share um, some of my stories, some of my learning and things I hopefully can help you. And I've been doing this series based on uh, uh, something I shared in Innovate Inside the Box. And it's a table based on a book from Growth Mindset Coach where they take down um, different uh, areas and then they provide examples with fixed growth mindsets. And what I did at Innovate Inside the Box is expand that to um, what would that look like with the innovator's mindset. And today we're going to focus on criticism. And this is a tough one. Criticism is something that people don't feel really comfortable with. And I'll, and not just receiving it, but sometimes how they um, provide it isn't always the best. So I'm actually going to talk about both elements, not only receiving, but also how do you provide it too? And what should you think about as you're providing criticism of others? And, you know, we can say coaching or whatever, but it is criticism, right? It's, it's a way to correct or to improve in our practice, uh, whether it's our prof professional selves or personal selves. <clears throat> so in the book, The Growth Mindset Coach, Annie Brock and Heather Hunley share um, these two categories for fixed and growth mindset. And so the fixed mindset, when they look at criticism, they share that negative feedback, regardless of how constructive, is ignored. Have I done that before? Yep, and probably you have too. So... Um, but there's sometimes where ignoring criticism is actually good. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. In the category of the growth mindset, they share that criticism provides important feedback that can aid in learning. Uh, and that's something that um, is really important as well. And this is why I wanted to distinguish between the growth mindset and the innovator's mindset. And here's what I share. Criticism provides important feedback, which creates the opportunity to implement new and better ideas for learning from others. So instead of just saying like, oh yeah, that was that was really helpful, or this is this is one of my big pet peeves, is when, you know, let me think about that. Because a lot of times that it's just no one's gonna, you're not gonna do anything with it. It's it's a stalling tactic. So really when you take that criticism, what do you do with it? And it doesn't mean that you always change your direction. Sometimes when you hear criticism uh, from you know, maybe certain people in your life that you don't necessarily have a relationship with, it can almost validate that you're going in the right direction when you don't listen to them. I know that that's a, sounds like a weird thing, but here's the example. When you actually are trying something new and something that's maybe a little bit daunting, people that you love and love you might criticize you because they don't want to see you fail. And when they don't want to see you fail, they'll almost hold you back in that space. And, and so sometimes you actually got to ignore it and figure out, you know what, I'm actually going in the right track. I understand why they're doing that too. I, I always think about this with my own kids that I don't want them to like break their arms and fall and try things that are, you know, seemingly risky, but it's the same, you know, in professional ventures, things like that too. So Sometimes not like I want my kids to break their bones and do dangerous things, but it is that mindset sometimes that when we criticize people, sometimes it's not to help them grow. It's to hold them back because of our own fear of failure and our own concern uh, in how we will see their failure. And you just got to kind of learn from that process. But as I get into this podcast, I want to share um, this quote from Norman Vincent Peale, and I, I really love it. The trouble with most of us is that we'd rather be ruined by praise than saved by criticism. And that really connected with me. And, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, sometimes when I go speak in an event, I'll get tons of really positive feedback. And it's, it's beautiful. People share these nice things. 
<clears throat> but what I've learned is as much as I appreciate that, don't get caught up in that as well. Like we say, hey, don't don't let the criticism bother you. And sometimes you're also going to say, hey, like, don't let that praise get to your head. Uh, I can have the best reception to um, a, 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 a keynote or a ta- or you know a workshop that I'm doing, and that feels wonderful. But I always am my toughest critic in that space. So because I've seen it over and over again, I something I do continuously. I always look at my own work and ask, "Hey, how could I get better? Here's some. Here's an area that I could go through." So sometimes you get caught up in the praise; it actually alleviates you from growing. It stops you from from getting better. You have to be the best at assessing your own work if you truly want to get better. Uh, I, I I look to people for advice. I look at people that are you know very close to me and you know ask them for advice and want the honest truth when I want to grow. But the person that has to deal with the results is always me. So I have to make sure that I take that criticism as well. And I I have learned that I try to criticize myself um, in my work before others get the chance. And this is going to seem like a, a really ridiculous example. Years ago, I was at a basketball game and uh, it was a Golden State Warriors game and I had an amazing seat. I got it very last minute. There was a single seat. And one of my biggest fears ever is actually uh, getting, uh, it, it was what I call a George Costanza moment. And there's an episode of Seinfeld where George Costanza is at a tennis match and he's eating ice cream and he's got ice cream all over his face. And, and he... Uh, he gets caught on camera and the commentators are making fun of him. So this is something I never wanted to do. So before the game started, I get some nachos, some cheese, and I'm eating these nachos because I don't want to be eating these nachos uh, at the beginning of the game. So Steve Kerr, the coach of the Golden State Warriors, he actually um, he actually stands right in front of me and it's on ESPN and there's me with nachos and cheese on my face. Now, someone sent me that picture immediately after, and I was so embarrassed. But then what I did immediately is I took the picture and posted on Twitter, and I said, hey, here's my Seinfeld moment. Because I would rather me make fun of me first than somebody else do that. And I know that might seem like a ridiculous example, but I just remember, I'm like, I'm going to own this moment. And I thought about this when I was a principal. Sometimes I would have tough conversations with some community members um, you know, some faculty. And one of the things that I used to do is kind of assess those conversations and say, you know what, that didn't go the way that I wanted to. And this is a reality in leadership. Sometimes people will say like, I don't like the answer this person gave, so I'm going to go above them. So what I would do often is I would actually call my superintendent, often my deputy superintendent, Kelly Wilkins, who I had a wonderful relationship with. And I would just say, hey, heads up. And I would tell her, I say like, hey, this didn't go the way I wanted. Here's something like, I don't know if I dealt with this, the best situation, but just in case you get a phone call, I wanted just to give you the situation before time so you don't get a, a negative surprise. And people tend to say they love surprises and that's not true. People love good surprises. People don't want bad surprises. I'm included in that too, right? And so it's better to say like, hey, here's something I did wrong. Here's something I could have done better. And I wanted to give you that heads up just in case you get a call. So you kind of know the situation before you're going in. And it was just a, it was a good approach for me. So I'd rather own the criticism first rather than someone else doing that for me. And I just wanted to share that example. Uh, the, the other thing too, is that as the owner of a publishing company, one of the things that I say to authors uh, consistently is that we are going to rip your book apart. We are going to really dig into it, find anything that we feel uncomfortable with, that we struggle with, that doesn't make sense, and really challenge it because the process of, um, of, of writing a book, the best thing that you want to do is get the criticism before it's published, not after. Because after it's published, you're kind of stuck, right? And so this is something that um, I've done as well. And it's, it's ultimately up to the authors. And that's something that's really important to myself and, and Dave, um, who are the co-owners of the company. It's ultimately up to the authors to listen to the criticism or not, because it's their name on the book and it's really their, their work right now. If something is super, we'll say like, Hey, this is a standstill. I've never had that situation come up, 
but we really talk to uh, the authors. So we're trying to give different eyes on the book so they can kind of see something different. And when you think of this, uh, I, when I was writing this down, this example, I also thought <laughs> that kind of that, that ownership uh, by the author that their name has to put up to it. There's also sometimes when you have to ignore criticism and cause you, you need to do what you are most comfortable with your name on, uh, what you are attached to. And I'll give you an example. When I first wrote basically the outline and the introduction for Innovator's Mindset, I had I was approached by several publishing companies and one of them, and uh, amazingly nice people, very, very nice. They took in my book and they had several people who probably didn't know innovation in the way that I did. And it wasn't really their focus area, but they had read a lot of education books and they ripped it to shreds and they wanted it to be much more academic than it was. But in all honesty, I'm not, I'm not an academic writer and there's a space for that, obviously, but it's just not who I am. I love telling stories. That's a really important aspect to me. Now, I, I know you got to back up those stories with, you know, some data and research, but for me, when I look at books, Sometimes when they're so heavy academically, I can't get through them. And when they're so story focused, but they have no, no data to back it up, um, they don't really necessarily make an impact. So I wanted to kind of build that little hybrid where it was really story focused, but had that connection. And so I was really bothered by that criticism. And I was thinking, you know, I need to revamp this, need to revamp this. And I remember actually having, um, I remember having, um, the contract from the company that wanted to publish the book and it was sitting in my inbox and I just something not, not right here there's something I don't feel comfortable with and then I actually met with Dave Burgess and he said hey have you signed a, a contract with anybody I said no 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 I haven't he said well, just hold off let me see it so he had read it and he said I love it and I remember him telling me people that want to buy your book are your audience who already love your writing to write in a totally different way um, doesn't make sense. This is who you are. And that always stuck with me because I didn't want to write a book, honestly, that I wouldn't want to read. So even though there's a criticism and I, I thought about it, there's always a space, you know, for those different and people that write super academic books, good for them. I have no issue with them. I don't look down on them or anything. And I hope they don't look down on me. I just think that there's different audiences that appreciate different things. And that's just the way I like sharing my message. So you have to, again, kind of think about criticism. What do you do with it? And how do you actually move forward? And sometimes moving forward is not changing direction, but it's actually being thoughtful and saying, actually, do I need to stay in the direction I'm going? Because I'm most comfortable and I, I appreciate the perspective, but they don't have to live with the results. That criticism from those people they never thought about it probably past the last sentence that they wrote in that document where I'm, where I have to live with my book forever. And I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud of the work that I did. And I'm glad um, that, that I listened to that as well. Now, it's not that I'm not open to criticism and changing direction. And as I was thinking about this, I, I asked myself, when was a time that I was criticized and really changed something in my work? And years ago, I was in Australia and I was speaking at a conference and I just would say this, this comment and I've said it, you know, hundreds of times prior to this event, I said, you know, you could be a new teacher that is totally innovating and doing incredible stuff and constantly growing, but you can also be a teacher that's taught for 30 years and don't want to learn anything. And if that's who you are, then maybe you shouldn't be here anymore. Right. And my focus in that comment wasn't to pit young versus old. It was to say growth is what matters. But I, I didn't phrase it very well. And I remember I got this email from someone and she had been teaching, I think, in the email she had mentioned 50 years. And in the email, she was so wonderfully polite. She was making jokes. You could tell that she really appreciated the stuff that I shared. But then she mentioned that comment and she said that if I love this because I'll never forget. It. She said it felt like granny bashing. Right. So she had been there for a long, long time. She's in her 70s. She's still teaching, still got tons of energy. And I looked at it and I wrote back to her and I thanked her for it. And 
ever since that day, I always say you can be a teacher that has taught for 30 plus years. And as long as you're still growing, that's all that matters. But you can be a teacher that's new to the profession. And if you just teach the way you taught and never want to grow, this is not the place for you and vice versa. So it really helped me kind of shape that. Sometimes the perception was not in the way that I delivered it on the person's willingness to grow, but more focused on their age. And I don't think I would have changed that approach unless I got that criticism. But it was also in the way that the person actually delivered the criticism and how they looked at it. And sometimes people deliver criticism in a way that I'm just like, whatever. And when, when I wrote Innovate Inside the Box with Katie Novak, and it was a wonderful experience, we had very deliberate um, ways that we wanted to write it. I would write parts of it, she would write other parts, and we just coincided. And one of the, the comments, and it was kind of funny, but it bugs me too. I'm not gonna pretend it doesn't bug me. All they just said was, uh, this book needed less George and more Katie. And I was like, that's kind of rude, right? And honestly, if you said it the other way around, also rude. What didn't you like about my writing? Where did you struggle, right? And, and, kind of, and part of it too is, it's really easy to criticize a book. Try writing one. You should really try writing one. It, it's easy to criticize something you've never done. But just that way, it was. It almost felt like a personal attack more than anything. It wasn't, hey, you know, I struggle with George's parts because A, B, and C. It was just like, I want less of that guy and more of Katie. And like I said, if it was the other way around, I would also think it was rude. Now, Katie and I, Katie and I are very, very close. And... Uh, I always say, you know, you know, we got to do less George, more Katie. And she laughs about it too. And we kind of joke about it, but what, how did that help anything? You know, and the perception sometimes when you deliver criticism is that the person will never see it, but I did. And it actually didn't make me change anything, but it did make me think less of that person. And it was like, okay, that's an interesting comment you made. And one of my favorite comments ever is from uh, Bill Simmons. I love his podcast. He's a big sports guy. And he said, the biggest muscles in the world are internet muscles. And I will never forget that comment, right? Because it's a super, no, that person would have never said that to us in person. I, I guarantee you, but it's really easy when you think no one's going to read it or you have no idea who I am. And I, you know, this is a pretty easy person to find, right? And like, it's like, is that really a helpful comment? So why I share this story is because it's also thoughtful that when we provide criticism, how do we deliver it? And, and I wrote a post about this years ago, and I shared three um, considerations for when providing for feedback. And the first one is, do I have any type of connection as human beings other than this initial interaction? And do they, and do they know their contributions are valued? And you, you think of that comment that I received, no human connection. I don't know this person at all. Uh, there's no nothing there that actually says how I'm appreciated and it's just a negative comment and I don't want to like look down on this person or anything like that because I've also done the same thing and I'll give you an example of this sometimes I would comment on blogs only when I disagreed with the person so I would never say hey I really appreciate this blog post I really love this or this is really great only when I felt compelled to challenge them is when I would actually share those comments and you think about how that person doesn't know I'm reading their blog, except for when I disagree with them. And what does that actually do, right? It, it sometimes then it feels personal, even though it wasn't meant to be. But there is probably a hundred times I would appreciate the blog, say nothing. And then the one time I disagreed, that's when I challenged. So I don't want to say like, I've never done this as well. This is something I've tried to get better at too. Like, hey, if I'm going to deliver this, and sometimes when... The only interaction I have is a criticism, but I think I've never shared anything positive with this person. I actually just choose not to share it because they, they don't know me at all. So how is this going to actually, you know, make things better? The second point I share is, do I ever connect with this person to say something positive or do I only share feedback with others or specific people when it is negative? And that kind of goes back to that initial conversation. And the, 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 the last one I share is that, am I open to be challenged and critiqued in the same manner in which I am ready to deliver? Uh, as, uh, as someone who worked as a, uh, a basketball referee, 
one of the things that I learned really well is to take criticism in a very brunt and quick manner. And what I mean by that is when you would referee basketball, and I've shared this before, you'd have sometimes an evaluator and they would sit in the stands and they would watch the first half and then they would go into the locker room at halftime and they would just say, you did this wrong, you did this wrong, you did this wrong. And they, they didn't have time to make positive sandwiches and tell you all the things you did right. And it wasn't that they didn't see you doing things right. It's they just didn't have time. You got to get back out there when the game starts, right? So there's 10 minutes. They want you to correct stuff. The, the referees that always did the best were the ones that quickly implemented what was said at halftime. Because they knew whether they stuck with it after the fact. And sometimes I would try things and say, you know what? I, I appreciate your advice. I tried in the second half. It just doesn't work for me. And they would understand that, but they, at least they'd see me doing this. This is where, this is why I say the innovator's mindset is so crucial is that do you actually do something with the criticism to test it out, to actually grow from it? And that's why sometimes I'll meet people that are speakers, have, you know, and haven't been doing this as long as I have. And I'll say, hey, like, um, I noticed that you said that you're really open to growth. Can I give you a couple of pieces of advice of some things that I say that, you know, really help me and, might help you and you could take them for what it's worth. But, you know, I know it's pretty rare that someone will give you feedback that actually does this work. And 99 times of 100, people have been really open to that because they want they know I'm coming from a place of support. And I, I really try to pe support people um, doing this work because I've been so blessed to have people um, who have done the same th thing for me. And I also have, you know, I'm the youngest of uh, four and... Uh, you know, I tend to get a lot of criticism, you know, from my family. You just kind of have to suck it up and get better because they, they tend to do that to the, to the baby. So uh, maybe it's something that I'm more used to. But I think maybe as I'm talking about this, when I say, am I open to being challenged and critiqued in the same manner in which I'm ready to deliver? Uh, that's a little bit of the golden rule. But I also think the platinum rule, if you've never heard of that, and I shared it in a previous blog post, is it's not about how you feel. Um, it's not about doing unto others what you do to yourself. It's really kind of understanding what others would benefit from and going there first. That's kind of the platinum rule. So how you take that criticism, not just learning from it, but applying it to moving forward. And sometimes that means changing direction. Sometimes that's being, you know what? I appreciate what you said, but and it's giving me some good perspective, but I'm actually going to go deeper into what I'm doing because I know this is the right direction, you gotta figure this out. It's not just learning from it, it's learning and applying from it. That's what really matters. So I just wanna share that with you, uh, this uh, season four, episode three of Mindset Monday on a Sunday. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks for all you do. Take care.